Welcome to the Fund Your Retirement Podcast. Hello and welcome. And in this week's episode, I'm joined by private investor, Mark Atkinson, who's been investing since the mid-80s. Mark achieved financial independence in his early 50s, living full-time off his stock portfolio of 36 stocks. Mark is here to answer some of the common questions he received after our first podcast chat, such as, how do I know I'm cut out to be an investor? Why does he invest in stocks and not funds? And how did he manage the transition going from full-time employee to financially independent and leaving the work environment? You can find the links to Mark's first interview on becoming a self-directed investor in the show notes just below. Hello, Mark. Thank you for joining us once again. Hello, Lee. Good to be back with you. The uh, first episode we did was really well received, so we got some really good questions in, some good feedback. We thought that it'd be good to do a part two where you can answer those questions. There were some quite thought-provoking questions as well that came through, which was quite nice, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've got to say, really bowled over by some of the feedback that we've had. People have reached out to I've never spoken to before, and they said, you know, can we connect in some way and share ideas and what have you? And as I think I tried to portray to you, I don't profess to know all the answers. I think the message is, if I can do it, I'm sure lots of other people can as well, with yeah. a little bit of discipline, patience, really. But but what I would say is that if people just take one or two things away from what I do, there's more than one way to, you know, to skin a cat. Yeah. And that if people keep visiting your podcast and they'll be able to select things from different investors and, and compile their own way of doing things, well, there's no absolutely right way and there's no absolute wrong way. They'll end up compiling their own strategy. You make a good point there because recently we've had quite a wide range of guests that all have different styles and approaches and, and it's been really interesting listening to all the different various different private investors go about it I and mean, it'd be fantastic to dive a little bit deeper into how you approach it as well. Yeah. One, one of the main questions that came in was how do I know if I'm cut out to be an investor which it's a really good question, very thought-provoking, isn't it? And I suppose for anyone listening to this, it's something, if they're thinking of doing it themselves, it's really where they need to start, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think not just investing, but in life, you need to be self-aware and you've got to know who you are and your strengths and weaknesses, and, and you've got to work from that. Benjamin Franklin, I think, said, observe all, my, all men, mostly thyself. When you're young, it's probably a bit more difficult because you're not fully developed at that stage. But as you get older, you've got a tendency to realize, I'm not very good at that, or I'm better doing this in a different way. So when you can recognize your personality, I think you can probably tailor your investing around that. There's no reason why most people can't do it. A couple of things that you need is some discipline and some patience. And if you're lacking those, then you're probably best going down the tracker route than being a, an individual shareholder. I think I mentioned in the last one that I concentrate on businesses that I, I understand. So that's something that you'll learn along the way. For example, I do my most difficult work in the morning when I'm fresh. That's what I my concentration yeah. levels. Or it's best. Now, so if I know I've got something I've got to read and really understand and take it in, I think I'm not going to do that in the afternoon. You know, sometimes you've no choice, but I think I'll do something a little bit, a little less demanding and I'll do that first thing in the morning. So it's just, just un understanding how you're built really. Can you share a couple of stocks that you've held for a while uh, and the reasoning for why you are holding them and continue yeah. to hold them as well? Okay. Just so the audience can understand your thought processes around a couple of stocks. If that's okay. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. And before we proceed down this route, this is going to say, these are not tips. These are strictly not recommendations or anything like that. These are just basically a couple of businesses that I've more conviction holds, but it mm. really is important this. And I know people say this as a disclaimer, do your own research, but it really is important that you do your own research just because it's a business that I'm invested in and I like it. It might not be, be the business for you because there's a saying when you've met one investor, you've met one investor, right? Mm. So my profile to risk might be different from somebody else's. My time horizons might be different to somebody else. I, I'm up to wait for 10, 20 years. Somebody said, when I'm looking at a six month, 12 months, yeah. I see a lot of investors who uh, all they're looking to do is look at a newspaper and see three letters in bold type, B-U-Y. And that's all they need to see in order to, to, to buy some of that stock. I know one investor, and it's a great anecdote. This was a number of years ago, and his washing machine broke down. He spoke to his neighbors about what their washing machines were, and he asked me about the washing machines. He looked at the brands, he looked at the functions, he looked at the capacity that the new washing machine would have. He really kicked the tires, looked under the bonnet, still like that. He really did it to death. 
And then he purchased some shares for about five or 10,000 pounds. Basically, I'm just somebody say so. Really important it's, yeah. that you do your own research. It really is important. It mm -hmm. really is important that you yourself understand that business. Yeah. Some of the recent private investors, uh, professional investors, and they've all had that same sort of theme. Do your own research, find the companies yeah. that suit your objectives, yeah. your outcomes. But I suppose that's the advantage of a, of a financial planner, a financial advisor. They will do that for you. If you're not cut out for this, that's fine. Don't worry about it. That there's no harm in that. You can book an appointment with a financial planner, which actually is the first step you should really do before you make any financial decisions anywhere mm. is make an appointment with a financial planner mm. and they will work out your objectives, your goals, your risk parameters, and they'll do it all for you. Yeah. I mean, it's going back to the, 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 the initial point about the self-awareness. If you know that you're not cut out for that, but find somebody else that is. Yeah. That's the thing. I'm, I'm not anthropologist. If you look at the, the development of the human species, it was the division of labor that we've been so successful that we, we weren't all doing the same job. We were, we were all throwing spears. And then you took me to one side and you said, look, Mark, we need to have a bit of a word with you. You don't throw them very far and you're not very accurate. I know, I know you're a bit crestfallen, but we want you to go back to the cave. And we've noticed that you're one of the best at actually making the spears. So yeah. you go, but you go back and you make the spears and we'll throw them. And that's how we've made progress. So it's nothing to be ashamed of that you've got things that are missing in your skill set, because that's yeah. the very thing that makes this whole system that we've got work. Yeah. Everyone's allowed to express their, their creativity and what they're actually good at. Again, strengths and weaknesses, isn't it? Yeah, Probably so, your strengths. Yeah. So now that's the disclaimer out the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've covered that. I think we've covered that enough. We've covered the disclaimer. This is not yeah. advice. Somebody's going to come after us now. Seek regulated uh, advice from a financial professional. Yeah. So the, the first stock is from an industry that I was involved in. So that's something about know your territory. And sometimes they're hiding in plain sight. It's not just some obscure business that's knows where the treasure is in El Dorado in South America, something like that. Yeah. And this is a company called Smurfit Kappa Group. They're manufacturers of, you know, corrugated and paper products. It's been around a long, long time. Corrugated walls, I think it was painted at about 1870, something like that. And that's a business that's just been waiting for about hundred and odd years for the internet to be invented. I like a business that's got a tailwind and this has got two tailwinds. The first being the growth of e-commerce, absolutely exponential growth, bricks and mortar is declining and it's going to fulfillment centers. Yeah. And I got some bathroom scales the other day, lots of lovely corrugated over it. So there's that. And the second tailwind is the anti-plastic packaging. There's two things driving this business forward. They are operational in 36 countries, South America, Europe, and they've got a fully integrated system of forestry, paper mills, conversion. So they got control over continuity of supply. They're literally sold out across the group. They can sell everything that they produce and that gives them the, the chance to bottom trim anything that they don't want to do and, and cherry pick the best business. That is like a, a thumbnail sketch. That's two or three minutes. Yeah. If you're looking at something, you've got to do a few hours on this. Yeah. I like what you mentioned there about the tailwind. You look at that the business can still develop and grow as well then, which is obviously quite important in your approach to selecting stocks. Yeah. You can look at a bit, there's other business got headwinds and they can still do all right, but in, in a dwindling market, but it's tougher. Yeah. I would imagine that if you are uh, thinking of investing into a daily newspaper, that's yeah. going to be tougher. Isn't it? Your market's getting smaller every day because the, the other people at the end, they're, they're falling off the perch. Who do you know under 50 who buys a newspaper? I'm not sure basis. I do. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I know anybody under that. Yeah. 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 So I can either try and play that and be clever, or I'll, I'll just go with what the wind behind it. Yeah. It, it seems like a boring business in lots of ways because it's been around so long. Yeah. We'd never, if we'd never invented corrugated and just come along. I think people would be really, really excited about it. It's only because it's just like I say, hiding in plain sight that it's out oh, yeah. there. And Pitney Bowles, they do a, an annual kind of report on the market. Their prediction is that the world number of parcels is going to double in the next five years. So that's a lot of capacity coming along. So yeah. when you think as a business, when you've got that going in your favor, if you're the management. In order to make a mess of that, you'd have to do a really bad job. <laughs> yeah. That's my thoughts. Yeah. Do they pay dividends? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, yeah, they, they pay a dividend. I think it's a, probably about three and a bit percent, something like that. They've a tendency, I think, to be increasing that about 10% a year over the right. last few years, but you'd, you'd have to check that. I, yeah, yeah. And how long have you held them for? That's a good question. Probably like seven years, something like that. We'll get onto time scales, I think, a little bit later on. Yeah. And if you don't mind just going through one more as well, there's a similar 
link with this business. It's commonly called Somero Enterprise. The ticker on that is SOM. That's a, a business based out in Fort Myers and they make uh, laser guided concrete leveling machines. It is a, a very popular business with a lot of private shareholders. It's a quite a, a well-known business. Yeah. And the similar link there is that they make concrete bases for fulfillment centers. And like I said, with the, the growth of e-commerce, yeah. Okay. Uh, the high street is it's dwindling away, and where we source our product from, it's coming. It's coming from more and more of these warehouses and fulfillment centres. This company got the technology to make sure that the warehouse floor is dead flat, and they've got uh, lots of patents involved in that. They've got very little competition, and 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 again, that's just a, another business that I think I think has got a, an ongoing tailwind. You know, they're a relatively small company. It's got a 220 million capitalization. They've been generous with their dividends. It, it has been up to now a cash cow and a lot of special, or as they call them, the state supplementary dividends. If you look at the last few years, you'll be able to see the, the dividend stream and it's actually got net cash. It's actually carries net cash. There's no debt at all. So I like businesses that have got net cash because it means they're not going to go bust if, if, if nothing else, certainly in the, in the short term. Those are, are, are two businesses that I, I, I can leave and they'll keep looking after me. Yeah. It's quite interesting the listening to you, the way that you describe these uh, stocks. First of all, you mentioned that they're, they're quite boring <laughs> like, yeah, and yeah. that's the general theme from previous private investors as well. They want their stocks to be quite boring. Also net cash there as well. Many of the, of the hot stocks of late actually haven't been generating. Yeah. They've been running on, you know, private capital and investors cash, haven't they? Uh, yeah. now, now in this downturn, we're seeing the, the results of that. So it's interesting that you're looking for businesses that have net cash in the, in a yeah. world that really presents the hot stock, the unicorn sort of tech company, which still many are not actually generating cash. Yeah. 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 I, I think a lot of, a lot of finance directors have, have seen these low interest rates. For so long, they think it's going to carry on forever. And debt can be a killer, whether it's whether it's for an individual or a business. Yeah. So you keep an eye on the debt levels as well. Of the yeah, yeah. And how long have you owned that company? The That's probably about five years. That five years again, so yeah. a long time. Yeah. yeah. And in the last conversation we had, you said that you had thirty six stocks. Yes. Is it still thirty six? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm considering one or two at the moment, but yeah, still thirty six. One of the questions that came in was. Are 36 stocks too many? How do you manage a portfolio of 36 stocks? I don't trade a great deal. I do like to get to know a business very well because they've all been in the portfolio for at least three years. At least I know them quite well. Some people think 36 is too many, but there's probably like a first team of about 15. They're conviction holdings. And then outside of that, there's the squad. You know, that might yeah. be another 10, depending on how they're performing, they might get in the first team, you know, yeah. and, and some of the first team might drop into the squad. And then at the, at the bottom end, there's a couple that have, have done badly. If you go through a pandemic and you've got a portfolio of 36 companies, you'll have done really well that if none of them have been affected in, in a yeah. bad way. So there's going to be some kind of damage to the portfolio there. Yeah. So there's a couple of those. Then there's a, a, another kind of grouping whereby I still like them, but I've liked other things better. So over time, as I've added capital to these other ones, they've fallen down the league table a little bit. And then there's some other businesses whereby I've made an investment because I've liked the business. I've liked the valuation. So I've made an initial in investment, but the thing is other people have recognized that as well. And the valuation has, it's got away from me a little bit. Right. Better. So I still like the business, but I've not been able to get any more capital in at that valuation. So I'm prepared yeah. to just leave that. And if it comes back in then I'll add it a another stage. How many hours would you say in, in a week or a month, would you actually dedicate to your portfolio management, not researching new possible additional stocks, but managing what you currently have? It's, it's very difficult to say. Yeah. I think the investing comes into two categories. The active investing of actually doing things is five hours a week, but there's a lot of loose investing where you're just speaking to people and you're, you're reading articles and you're just expanding your wider knowledge. So that yeah. is investing in a way because you're working on your judgments about what's happening to the world. Yeah. So it doesn't, doesn't feel like you're doing research, but you but actually you're are. you to the ground type Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah. And you're just doing it in everyday life. You're not speaking to CEOs and CFOs. You're just listening to what people are doing. Yeah, um, listening to podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. So could dovetail quite nicely into the next question that came in, to be honest, which was, yeah. Why do you use the information or knowledge of people around you rather than just your own research? We've already started on that really, haven't we? But that was one of the questions that came in. 
if we're aware of our faults or uh, our blind spots, it's by speaking to other people, I get more peripheral vision. And I think that I say this, that everybody I meet knows something that I don't, even if it's what brand of toothpaste they've used that morning. And I have to understand that not everybody sees the, the world through my eyes. If I just looked at products that I were interested in, I'd be missing out on, on a whole lot of things. And you, you see this in different ways every day, that something that you value, oh, I bought a new number plate, it's LC1 FYR, you know, it's yeah. cost me so many thousand, isn't it great? And I'd be saying, what no. have you bought that for? What, yeah, what a waste of money. <laughs> Talk about conspicuous consumption. You can't eat it. So that's something that I don't like. But I understand that other people do. And I've got to understand what people value. An, an example recently was my iPhone broke. Dropped it on the floor. And when your heart sinks, when it makes that splat noise, it landed face down and I picked it up and it looked like a spider's web. Ooh, yeah. Like, what do we do now? So anyway, there's a little computer shop close to where I live. And I rang them up and I said, can you put uh, a new screen on? Yeah. We've got some screens in, bring it down. So he went into the back room. Oh, he said, I'm terribly sorry. He says, yours is a black one. The only screens that we've got are white ones, right? So I said, well, what does that mean? He said, it's going to be white and, and the rest of your phone's going to be black. And I wasn't being facetious. I said, but well, the phone will still work. Oh yeah, yeah. He said, but it won't match. But I just want the functionality of it. Now he said, it was me. I said, I want it to match, right? Now my point being, I'm not saying I'm right. Yeah. I'm not saying he's right. We're just different. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's it. So the more people that I speak to, I understand other, other people's values. I always look for people who are better than me. And there's a lot of people better at me in lots of different things. I've got uh, a lot of other investors I speak to and you know, I seek people's advice and I said to people, you know, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? What am I not seeing? Permission to speak openly. And they do. And they might say, Mark, we think you're off beam. Have you not thought about this? It's recognizing your strengths and weaknesses and it's been very self-reflective of yeah. recognizing where your strengths are and where your weaknesses and, and how you can develop those weaknesses to, to come in line with your strengths. As we move on, one of the other important questions, actually, why do you not invest in index funds or investment trusts or funds in general? Well, I did invest in some funds. I am investing in one world fund and that's right. a hedge against me getting things wrong. But in general, I found that I was performing better than the, a lot of the fund yeah. managers and there's added costs in there as well. So a UK income fund, something like that, and they're charging you at one or one and a half percent and it's yielding 4% and then you're paying one and a half percent to the fund manager, for example. Yeah. And that's straight out the bottom line, isn't it? And we talk about compounding and, and over the long term, those commissions really do hit you over 30 or 40 years. It's an important point, isn't it? That the costs involved of funds or trackers, they are important because over 20, 30 years, it really adds up, doesn't it? Yeah. And we very often hear about uh, former star fund managers as well. There's one or two that have had a bad track record, so they can get it wrong as well. Yeah. So you've got 36 stocks. The last time you changed one out was three years, if I remember. Yeah, just over three years ago. Yeah. Um, you held them all for multiple years. Yeah. How do you control your impatience or your boredom in the markets? How do you um, prevent over trading? Yeah. Again, over trading is another thing that hits the bottom line. And it's it, again, it takes a lot of self-discipline. I think it's something that more and more people are after instant kind of gratification, mm -hmm. instant results. I think people have looked at the way that Bitcoin's moved and that, that's their expectation level. Things have got to move this quickly. I've learned to be patient to, and the rewards of it, but just got to rethink your, your time horizons and the way that we look upon how we invest. You might buy a stock, for example. And then you're 365 days later, you'll say, I'm reviewing this after a year. Now, I'm going to let you into a secret here, Lee. That stock doesn't know that you own it. Right? Oh. It doesn't know that it, it doesn't know what your time frame is. And the, the, they're like volcanoes that can be dormant for years and years and years, and then they can erupt. So when you were still working. Yeah. And I'm guessing towards the, the latter few years before, when you were starting to think I could go here, when you had a substantial portfolio, 36 stocks. How did you manage balancing a portfolio and gathering all the research while also maintaining a full-time job? Mm. Uh, yeah. For a long time, it was, it was relatively easy because you know, it doesn't take too much time. It's something you could be doing alongside your working. And that's good, the great thing about passive income. You're not to sell your time. When you're in employment, you're selling your time for so much money. So that's something you can be doing alongside that. It was only while really towards the end when I was attending annual general meetings and uh, on the front row, probing the CEO, <laughs> and, then, uh, 
and asking him questions and they'd have sandwiches and a, a glass of wine with him after. And then the next day- You went to that level to get yeah, information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and then the next day you're, you're unassumingly back, back, back at your desk. And I was, I was becoming more prominent then and I was a once interaction with the management. So it became more difficult to do that. So it was like, a, a, the last few years, it was a bit of a double life, really. It was a bit like, I wouldn't say Batman and Bruce Wayne, perhaps Dick Grayson and Robin. Now that's right, about, yeah. I mean, I'm going to a, an annual general meeting middle of next month and I'll be spending a couple of days over there. I'm turning it into a little break, yeah. turning the AGM and uh, make it into a mini holiday as well. Those are the things that, that I couldn't have done when I was, when I was still working. Yeah. Which actually dovetails into the, the next question quite well, actually. How's your mindset changed when you're now actually living off your investments full time? I think that is something again, by observing other people, all this that we talk about, nothing's new. Nothing's yeah. new here, Lee. Isaac Newton said, if I can see further, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. There's nothing unique in all this, but you know, I've seen other people who've, who've gone before me. The thing about investing from a, a young age of saving, you, once you get that discipline and it is a discipline, it can become very, very deeply ingrained in you. So that when it comes to, you've got your pot and then it gets to the stage whereby I'm having to erode it. And for some people. It's like a sacred trust that they can't touch, yeah. you know, they, and it's, that's the very purpose of it. Yeah. The very purpose of it is, is to enjoy it. I want to be able to do things with it. We all know people are just do another 12 months. Yeah. I'll just do another 12 months. And if you're not careful, you can end up with like a wheelbarrow full of money and unable to spend it because you're not fit enough to enjoy it. I'm 55 now. And I'm pretty sure no matter how much I try and work out and run and do whatever. I'm not going to be as fit when I'm 65. Yeah. But as you said at the beginning, uh, before we started the podcast, you're doing the three peaks, aren't you? Yorkshire three peaks. Yeah. You're up in the lakes on uh, Friday practicing for that. And yeah. as you've mentioned there, when you go into an AGM next month, you're going to make a little short break out of it. So that's right. I guess these are all the things now that you're able to enjoy because you've got the time. Yeah. It's not for everybody. Isn't it? No, you know, some people, you know, yeah. this is it. It's down to personal choice. That's yeah. it. Some people want to work till 67. I couldn't get out the door quick enough. I mean, I know one particular gentleman and he, he made a pri prison for himself. He was really lamenting his attitude towards his money because he realized that time had passed him by. Oh. I think that he'd not utilized it. And he said, you know, Mark, he said, I just like looking at it. Right. He, said, he said, that's the sign of the real miser, isn't it? Yeah, it is. As I'm getting older, I want to be bolder with my expenditure because something said that there's less in front of me. My ambition is to start spending more, not less. There's a lot of statistics about it. once you get to a certain age, it's, it's difficult to spend it because you, you can't get out. That's yeah. the thing. Well, there's a great way to finish the podcast. Be oh. bolder. Enjoy yeah. it. Ultimately, that's why it's far late to be enjoyed. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show again. No, really, really, really enjoyed it. I hope the audience has got some great insights from that. And we've answered the questions that came in from the audience. So please, you know, keep sharing. If there's any questions that you'd like to put forward. Yeah. Anybody ever asked a question of me, they'll uh, post a question. They'll always get a response, even yeah. if it's that we can't do anything together. So yeah. if anybody wants to reach out, they can do. And I know Mark, again, you've not got a book to sell a course or anything. You're just sharing your time and your knowledge. Shall I put your LinkedIn profile in there if people want to connect? Yeah, that'd be great. In the yeah. bio. Yeah. yeah so people want to connect with you. LinkedIn. Yeah, always, oh. always happy to hear from other people and their ideas. There you go. Someone might reach out and drop an idea yeah. in your lap. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. Okay, Lee. Cheers. Bye. Take it easy. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Fund Your Retirement podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please let us know by subscribing, sharing, and leaving us a review. Until next time, I hope you have a wonderful day. And bye for now.